odd that I'm on this side and you're on I that know. side. Okay. But you're really good at it. Uh, here we go. Welcome into the Suds with Luds podcast presented by the Dub Network. And uh, we're going to do a lot of crazy things here on this show this year. And speaking of crazy, and since a lot of us out there listening are Stars fans, I think the best person to bring into this is the one and only Mike Heika, the insider, the Elliot Friedman. If anybody knows anything about <laughs> the NHL, there's a man by the name of Elliot Friedman that just is able to get scoop after scoop after scoop. He's the Elliot Friedman of the Dallas Stars. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Craig. What have you been doing I'm this looking, summer? I'm looking forward to all of your <clears throat> podcast telecasts. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I, I'm a huge ticket fan, so I know Mike Reiner and... Uh, I know what he can do, and this will be great. It was the first thing that you brought up. Yes, he's like it's. That's, he's, like some, he's he's a legend. I think he really is. is yes, I, I call sure him a genius. That. He, you yeah. call him a genius. Yes, right, a radio <laughs> genius. Because what he did, and I think this fits in with you perfectly, and with the other people here, is he took radio, sports radio, and made it conversation. Mm -hmm. So then you're just sitting there on a bar stool, drinking a beer and talking about sports or women or TV or politics or whatever is going on. And I think you guys will do a great job here. It's just, he picked the right people. Isn't that kind of, we might as well bring up Razor's name now yeah. because it's going to come up and he'd be mad. It's kind of when we got to, when, when Dave Strader um, wasn't feeling well and they asked me to come in and kind of help out in that process. It's one of the things that I remember Razor saying is, we're just going to be two guys sitting at the bar having a beer. And I'm like, I'm in for this. Yeah. But I actually thought he was serious about that. I didn't know we were going to be on TV. I thought we were going to be two guys sitting at a bar talking about it, which I think would be a better broadcast than half the things that are out there because I love what's going on in the NFL with yeah. them two guys on Monday night. I don't know why. And I think that I actually think that there would be a way that you could do something where you could have the headset kind of thing like NASCAR, but you can either listen to them or you can listen to me and Richard Matvichuk and call the game and yeah. talk the way that hockey players actually talk. So um, <clears throat> I want to start with, I saw something. I've been doing this now with Stars for what? 25, 26? Yeah, 26, 27. 26, 27. Well, but, technically, I, did, I missed the first year. So 93, okay. uh, they had another guy cover it. And then they didn't like what he did. So I was working for the Star Telegram. And I started in 94, which was a lockout year. But it was half a year. And then ever since... But didn't you I go did. to many the I last did. month that we were playing as yes. the Minnesota North? I do my research. I know. Do, so why? Well, I know why. But I guess my, fir my, my first question with that would be is, what was your impression after that month of the team, of the, of the players? Team. of And then secondly, was it going to work? Um, I was worried about, is it going to work? Because they had, I've been to many exhibitions at uh, Reunion Arena, mm -hmm. uh, and they were not well attended, and they were not, and again, it, neutral side exhibition games back in the day were not good, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, that's all we had, so we're sitting there watching this going like, I don't know, it's like 4,000 people in a 16,000 seat arena, you're like, I don't know if we're going to be able to get tickets, um, but I think the fact that, one, you had two really good promoters uh, in Jim Light and Lights. Jeff Kogan, yep. and two, they understood the Dallas sports fan. And Kogan and Lights both embraced the physicality. And so uh, I went up to Mini for a month or so, came back here and helped them transition, you know, to get, sell tickets, do whatever. I was working for the Star-Telegram. Uh, the Morning News hired a guy from New York, Terry Egan, a very respected yeah. writer at the time. Uh, and so we just kind of helped promote things. Well, the number one star for that first summer wasn't Madonna, Shane Turla. I was, was going to go there. And they pushed him. And they said, you're going to love this guy. Mm -hmm. And then Randy Galloway gets on board and goes, I love this guy. Yep. And the fighting aspect of it, the physicality of it, that arena was so good. Like, I didn't think it was going to be good. It was great because the ceiling was low. There were no suites. And the seats were right on top. You were on top of the yep. ice. Um, and then once you see the game in person, it really is different. And I think that's what in, the fans took to heart was once you see the game in person. And we need to speak about the fans at the time. <laughs> but but it was I remember saying, and it was probably after I was done when they asked you about going to Dallas and things like that. And they said, the, you know, there's a saying out there, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. 
it wasn't true because just like you mentioned with Shane, all of a sudden, you know, for the first month or two, whatever it was, we could go into, I went into a bar a couple different times here in Dallas, you know, to check things out. Yeah. And so, But people would know who you were. And it's like, this doesn't even happen other places. And and I just said, it won't take long and they're going to be talking about this other guy that's a pretty good player and looks like a model and things like that. And and, and so it was. And Charles was a hero. And he should be. I mean, yes. I, I'm, I was happy. And I was... I was that dummy's roommate for the whole time he was here. And so <clears throat> that's a whole nother show. I don't even know. <laughs> you I don't gotta even, get him on. I don't even know if he would. There's a lot of things he doesn't want. I'm, I have no problem talking about him. Right. There are things. We actually even had a couple fights. There were times when we had a hard time remembering where our room was. And that was late at night. And the, the keys at the time didn't have the numbers on there. No. And, and so, and we didn't carry our IDs and things where we were. And the only, they wouldn't give you. A key if you didn't have ID. So one guy, we had to take turns at this. One guy would sit in the lobby and, and he would call our call the room and just say, I need Craig Ludwig's room. The other guy would be on the floor and he'd be running up and down listening where the phone was ringing. <laughs> and then, and then, then you could hear him yell or something would happen. I got it. And so that's how we found our rooms at the time. This my, one of my friends uh, in school, and I think you know people, you may have been this person, uh -huh. worked harder at cheating than he did at actually studying and getting good grades. And that to me is you guys, because you- If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. You were so intelligent that you came up with this plan yep. to find your room, but you could, weren't smart enough to just like- write down, oh, I'm in so-and-so and I'm going to get drunk tonight. So, well, and we But were, you knew once you got right. there, you got to be resourceful. And we were smart enough to know that if you come in after curfew and the guy behind the desk is saying, he's got a hockey stick saying, hey, would you sign my autograph? You don't sign that because no. the coach gave it to him because he wants to catch who's out after there. Now, to the fans. Okay. I remember one of the preseason games, first year there, it was like second, and it was Neil Broughton, myself, and a couple other guys sitting there just in the stands watching the game. And... Dallas, we had scored, and I remember one, and there were a couple of cowboys. They were sitting right in front of us, and one looked at the other one. They had a couple of cocktails, too, and they said, they don't even know how to keep scoring this thing. They only put one point up there. I think he thought it was a field goal. Right. <clears throat> right? So the fans. I mean, the one thing I always go back to is how Ralphie was obviously part of this thing, where yes. they were doing the 101 stuff at intermissions, right, and trying to teach yep. the how did you see the fans and how did what did you see of them coming along with us for this ride? We had the same job in the newspapers and newspapers were big back then. I mean, it really was how a lot of people got their information. Um, and I, I remember so I think it was maybe this third or fourth year they changed some of the rules. Uh, and so they moved the uh, the net further away from the back wall okay. and short shortened the neutral zone. So I'm writing a story up and I'm at Star Telegram and my editor says, What's the neutral zone? And I'm like, oh boy, you're the sports editor. Yeah. And you, I said, what's the batting box? What's yeah. the end zone? But he didn't know. And so then that was just like, okay, you really have to be fundamental at this stuff. And it was a little bit of everything. So I'm from Michigan. Uh, we moved. So in. you have a background in the game and you know how to write it, but now you had to tailor it Correct. to your audience. But what was interesting is, so at that time, so I moved here in 83, this would have been 93. And there were a lot of people from up north moving to Texas because mm -hmm. economically it was just a much better place to live. And so you had that, let's say, 30 percent or 40 percent of people who really knew the game. And they were giving you crap because you weren't hard enough on them sure. and saying, and then, then you had the other part that was just like, we, we just want to watch these athletes. They're so great. And so there, there was an interesting mix of, do we need this pressure? Do we need to, do our columnists need to lean heavily on them? Or are we just here trying to bring the fans along and say, eh, you know, it's yeah. a game. Let's have fun. But the one good thing you guys did is you won right away. Uh, that was the key, right? Because huge. the fans kind of got, into us a little bit. Didn't we go to the second round or whatever it was? And so that got him to buy in a little yeah, bit to what that was, was going a, on. That was, again, Shane Churla, uh, Pavel Bure. Uh, that was when he suckered him, yeah, wasn't it? Sucker yeah. punched him. Yeah, and, yeah he and got an elbow in the head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because basically because Churla crumpled him in the yeah. uh, offensive zone, he yeah. came back in the defensive zone and just, and no, and Brian Burke at the time goes, Come on, he's Shane Churla. Exactly. Couldn't hurt that much. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Yeah. So, 
all of that, I think, started to tie into one, they're fun. I think Mike had 50 goals that year, which mm, is okay. also fun to watch. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, two, it was a really physical team. Yeah. And you know, that was at the time, though. You know, that was part of it. And the other thing about reunion is the glass. The glass would really give and it was loud. Yep. And so when you would hit people, they would think, oh my God. But it really wasn't even that big or that hard. I remember our first. Uh, Preseason or one of our preseason games we played in Fort Worth. Was it, yes. was it called Will? What was it called there? Well, technically, you guys yeah. played at the convention center. Okay, but the Will Rogers was there, and that's where the minor league team. When was. we stepped on the ice, we couldn't believe what we saw. It was all these crickets. They were frozen in the ice. Yeah. It was. They were covered the whole surface of the ice, and, and you know, I don't even know if we knew what crickets were at the time. Like, yeah. I mean, there's big as a bird down there, and so we were. And then we were kind of like, what are we getting into here? And then all that stuff unraveled. You, play, you played the Blues, and there is no press box in the Fort Worth Convention Center for hockey. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting in the stands about two rows from Ron Curran. The prof. And he's up there for the Blues, and he is just swearing. He's not liking what's going on? Didn't just, that's what he did. I yeah. think that's what how he watched every game. Yeah. Because we had a couple... Like, so the press box at Reunion, you were right next to the visiting, yeah. you know, but yeah. here, I'm, and I mean, like, you could hear, like, there was maybe, I don't know, 4,000 people in the building, sure. and yeah. you could hear every F word he said, yeah. and I'm going like, well, yeah. that's hockey, yeah. they're getting a good lesson tonight. <laughs> uh, Mo did, they used to, you guys used to have kids day for practice, and you'd go out to, like, you know, uh, well, actually, it was probably in, in Las Colinas, you'd bring in a, a class, and then... You know, they would watch you practice. And Mo came in one time and just took a shot and went right off the crossbar and goes, Oof! Oh, like just no. screamed. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I looked over. You, you can say fuck here. It's okay. Okay, okay yeah. good. Okay. Fuck! Yeah. And you're just like, the kids are learning about yeah, hockey, hockey right now. I was going to say, that doesn't sound like the right group you want to bring in. <laughs> I know. You know, you may want to bring them into a different sport so much, not 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 a bunch of hockey guys. <laughs> I think it was just everybody was trying to promote the game and, hey, let's get the kids in here. And how do you. Because you you always have you have a certain style when you talk to players, right? I guess you have to because you have to earn their trust in a way to be able to talk to you. But I, I'm always curious about because there's other there's reporters that you know there's a guy on Twitter I think it is and all he does is stir the pot all the time and it's about injuries and I'll get into that later. But you must have to do you get to know the player and figure out how you talk to that certain player to use the same kind of approach with every single guy. Uh, no, it's different with everyone. Yeah. And, and I'm, you're the greatest example of this because we both lived over in Tarrant County. Yeah. So we had stuff to talk about. So I think that's the entree is, what are you doing? Where yeah. do you live? What do yeah. you, you know? Uh, oh, well, you like motorcycles. Oh, look, there's a Harley Davidson shop over there. Oh, my brother has a Harley. You know, it's right. stuff like that. Yeah. And Mo was the same way. I remember talking to Mo about, well, what would you do if you weren't a hockey player? And he goes, oh, probably a baseball player. And I go, you would not. Right. And he goes, no, really? Yeah. So I call his mom, which is a weird thing to do. But, you know, I go, so... Mike said he'd be a baseball player. Oh, she goes, oh, he was much better at baseball than hockey. I don't know why he chose. And you're just like, really? And so it's stuff like that that leads in where each one is different. Um, and, and then again, uh, Tim College was really good at this. Just be honest with people and, yeah. and be a human being. Um, and, and so like Maddie, uh, I said something about how he had learned as he matured that some days you skip going to the bar afterwards. And he got mad about that. And he was like, you know, really? why would you write that in the newspaper? And, oh, and I get that part a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And, and I said, well, we were sitting there talking. He goes, he goes, you need to know when we're talking about the game. On the record and off the record. And, and again, and he didn't say it that way about the game and about what you're going to put in the newspaper. He goes, you need to tell me. And so that was a great lesson for me. I mean, it was probably the second, third Maddie year. should have learned that lesson a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I didn't. Uh, no, I, I've always, because I've always respected you for that. And, yeah. you know, and you can have those conversations. And, and we don't even have to say to you, it, hey, this isn't on the record, right? Because right. it was never, again, coming from Montreal, where apparently everything's on the record, what they think, you yeah. know. So it, it, it's that it's that relationship that you have. And then to be able to get stories and scoops from general managers yeah. and, and things like that. And I, I don't know if they ever, do they, any of them ever really tell you the truth, but do you, you probably have information that you don't even put in there. You yeah. know, you got, because you have to go back to them again sometime later, right? Right. Or like now I actually work for the team. And so then they're just like, you know, 
it's actually kind of freeing because before you would every day you'd get up and try and figure out what they're going to do transactionally. Like mm -hmm. you're going to send somebody down, yep. or you're going to trade yep. for somebody, you're going to do whatever. Well, now they won't let me break that. So then I just have to wait till they announce it. Then yep. I react to it. So that's been a little bit easier. Uh, but I remember uh, one of the things I did with Bob Ganey, I got a lot of respect from for this one is, so me and Kyle Shaw are the two beat writers. He writes for the morning news, I write for the Star Telegram. And uh, we're both trying to find out who they're going to sign in free agency. And so I write an article that says the stars are interested in Ed Balfour. Here's his numbers, yada, yada, yada. And Tim writes an article that says uh, the stars have made an offer to Ed Balfour. Here's the contract numbers. And here's a quote from Bob Ganey. And so then I have to go back the next day. And back in the day, there was no internet. So you just, whatever was in the newspaper, that was good for the rest of the day. And so I go back to Bob and I said, what happened here? And he goes, well, he goes, I talked to both of you at six. I told you exactly the same thing. Tim called his agent, called me back at nine. And so I confirmed what the agent said. Mm -hmm. And and I said, well, he goes, and Tim earned it because I went out and played softball last night. And he goes, and he just shook his head like, and he, because at the time, you would have reporters who would just throw a fit. But did Jim, GMs, now it seems like numbers are always public. What well, if, but because, did they give you those numbers? No, the agent <sighs> gave it. To Tim. Were they pissed when they when the, were the GMs pissed when I the number got out there? I don't think Bob was. Right. Again, different ones, different thoughts. Bob, one of the greatest things he ever said was so they were having a negotiation with like three high end players all at the same time, and uh, Bob and Doug uh, Armstrong are having to figure out okay, does this guy get whatever you know two point three million? Does this mm -hmm. guy get one point five million? And uh, Bob looks at me and goes, can we just take a wheelbarrow and just dump it in the locker room and make them sort it out? Yeah. And he really believed that. Like, I agree. Like, yeah. you know, do you, like, I had a conversation when uh, uh, Les and Brett Hull were the co-GMs. Yeah, that, that experiment worked that well, didn't really it? That was really fun. <laughs> anyway, so it was just a great expression on Les's face. Is so I'm talking to Brett and we're talking about offensive players and yada, yada, yada. And I said, well, it's just like you and Carbo. He goes, well, what do you mean? I go, well, Carbo made a million his, you know, the year you guys won the cup. Uh, you made six, I think. I, I made think. shit is what well, I mean. I know. Well, yeah. you, you actually, yeah. compared to me, I think you made yeah. a lot. Uh, but, uh, but I said, but you weren't six times a player. You didn't have six times the impact. And he looks at me and goes, yes, I did. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And, and Les is just looking at me like, you really want to open this can? <laughs> yeah, of right, right. And I said, Carbo said, I want to shut down Forsberg and then did it. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, you scored key goals, but that's every bit as valuable. Oh, if not more. And yeah. Holly goes, if I if they told me to shut down Forsberg, I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> and Les looks at you see what I'm dealing with here. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, point being is all of those guys, they have their ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh Doug did not want to give out any numbers. Doug did not want to help the media in any way, shape, or form. Bob did. Yeah. Um, but he also knew the rules. Uh, when Bob was GM in uh, Montreal, I was uh, uh, technically the NHL writer for the morning. News. Right. And so I called him to get his comment on some NHL story. And he goes, uh, well, are you calling me just as a friend or are you calling me as a reporter? And I said, as a reporter. And he goes, well, you'll have to go to the PR department. And I'm like, what? And he goes, I got you on the phone right now. Can't you just give me, you know, mm -hmm. two lines? And he goes, no. He goes, not in Montreal. Yep. And so, again, different places, different things. I think Doug has calmed down since he's been in St. Louis because it's a little bit different. You know, he got some wins under his belt. He's big in Canadian hockey now. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I think he was really nervous. And he did not want to give anything to anybody as far as reporters go. So, again, it's the same thing. It's, these are people. I have a different relationship than with you than I would have with Donald Audet. Sure. Or whoever. Oh, that little I... piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> they came up to that's when I was I was kind of coaching. I was in our minor league team, then came back, and so I go on the ice all the time. And I got a call from our GM one day, and he goes, Let's, you can't be running the players. You can't be chopping their ankles. And I'm like, Well, this little fucker, like he did nothing. Like he was just nothing for at least for us for the time. So <clears throat> anyway, speaking of hockey, speaking of Stanley Cup. <laughs> speaking of hockey. You mentioned the Stanley Cup. Give me your thoughts on since it just got 
over with. And and uh, w- what were your thoughts on more of the finals, but the, the playoffs and things like? What did you think? Two things. One, I like the way the direction the game is going. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the fact that a Colorado that, va- that kind of style game we're talking. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, now it's funny because. And I've said this on our podcast and, and whenever people ask is that when you get to the playoffs, you better be able to play defense. Yep. And that's just us, the, the, the people in Florida that are uh, Toronto, yeah, Edmonton. I mean, I mean, just go down the list. You feel bad for Brunei, the head who took the job over. And but again, the whole my whole theory, I'm not I'm going to let you keep going. But my yeah. theory has always been play the way that you're going to play all year long and don't try to change when you get 10 games before the playoffs be comfortable with your system they were but you have to have a healthy balance of knowing how to play on your own end i mean all they did is score goals right and didn't didn't work because they played against a pretty good team that knew how to counteract it now that being said colorado is not what i would say great defensively Mm -hmm. they're very good they play defense with the puck correct and that's a smart thing to do yeah and then Mm -hmm. the other thing is they score yeah Uh, you you score against vasilevsky you you're doing a pretty good job, and I and I would say, wouldn't you say that? Because I I actually picked I picked Colorado to be in in the finals long long time ago. They were just easily yeah, the best team in the league. They're building. And as the playoffs went along, I'm like, it's going to be Tampa Bay. It's going to be Tampa Bay. And then I ultimately took Tampa for only one reason: goaltending. Yep. And there was one guy that was proven and is the best in the world. Maybe not through the playoffs this year, Vasilevsky quite wasn't. But the other guy at the end of the rank seemed to have bobbles. Yep. But I think that from Kemper's standpoint. The Colorado goaltender is there's maybe less pressure on you to playing for a team like that because they can get me three or four goals. So yep. I let in a bad one. They're probably gonna they'll probably outscore my mistakes. Yep. And it was nice to see them win. Um, but that that was my feeling with them. But they're loaded with talent. Yes. I mean, you, you go up and down that lineup. Well, and again, <laughs> for Stars fans, all you got to do is watch Val mm-hmm. and see. Oh yeah, I was gonna bring that up. Yeah. Aren't there two former Dallas Stars on that just won a cup like a week ago? Yeah. Yeah, Val and uh, Andrew Cagliano, and they're gone. And all you hear, all those Colorado players, they all talk about Andrew Cagliano. And he's only been there for like 30-some games. Right. They said the same thing here. and Well, isn't that a piece that you want? Yes, but they also went out and got... Oh, that's right. you got to talk to the GMs here now. No, no, I I get what you're saying. (laughs) I think it's easy to say... Cogliano was a guy who really fit. So Cogliano, when he was here, got tons of scoring chances and didn't capitalize, and he got hurt. So then they went out and got Glenn Denning, who's kind of a younger version of Cogliano. They say a lot of the same things about him. Now, he doesn't have the same, as near as I can tell, presence. Mm -hmm. And Cogliano has a presence. Mm -hmm. And I think he was the right player at the right time. And had he stayed in San Jose... He may have just retired, and it's you know, right. but he got lucky and got traded to the right place at the right time, and they could use him. So I do agree with you. You're going to give up good pieces, and it's the chemistry it's, in the room that is important, along with the guys that can score and play. And you have to find those elements and who to plug in where. And, and the thing about Andrew Cagliano, in my opinion, is he knows how to read the room. Mm-hmm. So when you can tell by all of these guys talking about a player that's only been there for 37 games. Correct. So when he came in there, he knew how to act and mm-hmm. interact and play on the ice. And all of those things were the perfect fit for that time. Now, would he have done the same thing in Dallas? Probably. But mm-hmm. again, this team wasn't to the place where Andrew Cagliano was the missing piece. Like, Don't you think that Dallas has kind of been looking for that kind of I mean, they went out and got Sharpie. And, you know, some of these guys that had been places, won cups, and were voices in the rooms, which to me, when from the outside looking in, it's like, okay, so are you kind of saying that you don't have the voices in the room? So we're, and it's not easy for a player to come in from another team and then get plunked in the middle of the room and then take it over right away. Correct. You know, because you kind of feel your way through and you don't want to step on other toes and things like that. So well, they, have they been looking for that player? They've been cutting their own legs off a lot of times. Because if you want to say it, and I do, I think Jason Spetz is one of the greatest humans in the game. Isn't that kind of why you think Toronto kept him around? Yes. Well, he may even come back and play this year, but they're keeping him in the organization. And I think that he'll be able to step down if they need a player. But I think they want his voice in the room. Another so, guy that that guy was here too, right? Yes, that's okay, what I'm saying. So my sure point thought, is, thought, they had better. that guy. <clears throat> Hitch came in and hated him. Why? I don't know. Hitch hated him. Soft. 
That's the word Hitch likes to use. Or overpaid. Yeah. I, th I think that bothered Hitch too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that did bother him. If he well, that's not the player's fault though. No, I know, but right? again, <clears throat> you I don't know why. Wait, that might be Hitch calling me. It right could now. be right no, now. He's not. listening. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know why all that stuff works in, but it does. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny. I remember Dave Reed signed his. Six hundred thousand yeah. dollar contract back yeah. in the day, and was scoring twenty goals a, a season. Yeah. And I said, you know, aren't you mad? And he goes, well, a little. He goes, but at the same point in time, every single list that says one of the most underpaid players, one of the greatest bargains in the league is Dave Reed. That, he's getting good pop. And he's like, there. yeah, that's me. That's me. Yeah, I'm that guy. And so there's, you know, you got to juggle and figure yeah. out what the best thing is. I don't get why different players work and don't work, why the chemistry between a coach and a player goes sour. Mm -hmm. um, but it does. And so one of the problems, and part of it's Jim's fault, part of it's the organization's fault, part of it is just what it is, is they haven't had a linear um, philosophy, I would say. I know Jim Nell wants to be competitive. He wants them to be uh, hardworking. He wants them to be smart. All these things are really good. But when you go from Lindy and Lindy's system fell apart because yeah. they well, you, they weren't sure and Lindy got his feelings hurt because he, he kind of wanted to play an open kind of let's go well, style. Did. And when you play that kind of style, this is just my opinion, right. again, when you play that kind of a style and you're going to open things up at the other end of the rink. Correct. And if you were going to open up things at the other end of the rink, you want Vasilevsky there. Or okay. Eddie. Already yeah. at the time, the goaltender at the time wasn't playing his greatest. No. And so you have, in my opinion, you have to start recognizing that and saying, right. listen, we can play this way, but we're not getting the stops that we want. So maybe we got to pull back a little bit instead of trying to outscore your mistakes the whole game Correct. because you're not getting the help from the other end. So That's Lindy's contract comes up. They're saying the same thing in the front office. Well, it's not working. Mm -hmm. We got to do something different. And so then Hitch comes in for one year and that, I don't know how that all occurred between ownership and GMs and all I that do, good stuff. I do, but it's I not know. a conversation we're no, going to have here. But anyway, point <laughs> being is so then they change horses in the middle of the stream. They go to Jim Montgomery, which seemed like a pretty good move at the time. Mm -hmm. But again, that blows up in their face. Mm -hmm. Then they have to scramble. And then when you look at one of the reasons I think this reset is a good thing is because when they scrambled, it was a patchwork. So, you know, here you bring in what I believe is one of the best assistant coaches in the league, and he's not the assistant coach anymore. So you're like, what good is having a great defensive coach and penalty killing coach? Which is my, on my list to talk about yeah. are the coaches and specifically the assistant coaches. Correct. And, and Rick Bonus had it nailed. Yes. And what you are as an assistant, you're a buffer between the head coach and the players. Yep. Rick Wilson. Rick Wilson with us was incredible. He could be hard, but he could understand. And he had to read that when when Hitchcock, whoever comes in and, and lets you have it, you got to go, okay, that's cool. And then you kind of slide back in. Okay, here, here's what he meant. Just Correct. chill. I'll go talk to him. And and I think it's difficult for for a guy like Bones where he had to go from being like that for what, half years? a decade? Yeah. And then had to be that guy. And I think he did his best to be that guy. And I think it becomes hard. But then the guys that you have as assistants, they have to take that role over and then they have to somehow become that guy. And it's not it's not the same as football. But what if you were a defensive coordinator your whole career and then you become the head coach sure. and now you got to run the offense? Yep. You're like, that's really not what I do. You know, I, don't, I never understood that, but it is what it is. The, the head coach changes the forwards. And so then basically the head coach directs the offense of the team mm -hmm. and the forward group. But that's not what Rick had done for most of his career. Yeah. So now you take his strength, which was helping Miro Haskinen, helping uh, John Klingberg, you know, helping all the young defensemen. And I, they were one of the best penalty killing teams when he was the assistant coach. Yeah. And take all that and move it to a different place. And John Stevens did a good job. But again, it was different. And so then John goes from, hey, I'm coming here because I'm really good friends with Jim Montgomery. Oh, but he's gone. And now you're like, okay, yeah. how does that work? And then, you know, uh, Derek Laxdell comes up from the minors, which was fine. Uh, but then he has to make his adjustments. Todd has to make his adjustments. It was just an oddly assembled it group. It was. Don't you think that, why can't you take the philosophy from football? I will tell you because in New York, when Al Arbor, 
was was there, and it was Lauren Henning and Darcy Regeer were were the uh, assistant coaches. And Ray Al Arbor just stood back like this. He yeah. stood there and watched the game. Darcy and Lauren did everything. Every, every once in a while, he'd whisper in their ear or something, or he'd whisper to a player, but very rarely. Even the meetings, they ran the meetings, yeah. and, and Al would stand in the back of the room. You knew who was in charge, but he kind of oversaw everything. And and I just was curious why that doesn't happen more often. I think it should. It's that relationship kind of deal, which, which again, the other question I always have in the NHL is, does any other league fire the coaches like the NHL does? Is it not? I mean, Vegas is on their own island, right? Right. But um, it's it's incredible. Like every time, every two years, three years. I mean, it's probably why coaches want to get a four year deal. Yes. You know, and um, but I mean, wh- I don't understand the philosophy of firing coaches so often. Here. Well, and I think Bednar is the best example because if you would have talked around the league, he they, was, he was gone like he, a year ago, wasn't right. he, or two, two years, years ago? ago probably. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just like, mm, some... and that's because the GM. Well, was it or was it because he's getting pressure from somebody? Well, I don't, I don't know. This maybe situation. the owner, right? That's what I'm saying. I think the, the, owners... the guy that just won two championships in six months, right? The guy that owns LA, the Rams, right? And so, I mean, thank you, Joe Sackick, for you know hanging with this guy. So, and now, now since we're let's go into coaches. Yeah. Um, first off, is it not odd? that your general manager only has a year left on his contract and you're going down to try to hire coaches, whether, forget that it's Pete DeBoer, but that's got to be a tough situation for the coach. Well, they said at the press conference that when Pete was having his discussions with the Gallardi family, that he said, I need Jim Nill to be here for the time that I'm here. So again, they were not specific, but it sounds like Jim Nill will be the GM for three to four years. They will transition to a potentially new and different GM near the end of the four years, depending on how everything is going. And then they'll move forward. And I think Jim would be the the way they do it, I thought, in um, uh, Vancouver. Um, uh, Who else? Brian is Brian Burke does it a little bit in Pittsburgh and different. You're Uh, almost like the the director of the GM. mm -hmm. You're the director of hockey operations. So you're the GM's boss. You're not on the phone every day trying to make trades. And so then you bring in. Well, Jimmy Rutherford is kind of, he's kind of the GM there, but he went out and really hired a GM. So it's like, well, I can fire him, but I'm not going to fire myself. It's like when Bob Ganey was GM and head coach here. He was smart enough to step back from coaching instead of the general manager. Yeah. Because he's not going to fire himself. <clears throat> so I never asked you this one. Were you there when he walked off the bench? I think it was Chicago, wasn't it? Like that I, was, if he, I, I was probably, I would have been there, but, but I just don't, don't remember. remember it. Why did he walk off the bench? I think he realized he couldn't be the head coach anymore. I think oh. this was in whatever, when was Hitchhart? Uh, 1995, 96? See that? I swear. None of that surprises me. I don't remember that. But Bob Ganey is my Scotty Bowman. Right. You know, I mean, he was a captain in Montreal when I was a rookie. And and he would bring me to the back of the plane as a rookie and give me a piece of paper. And, you know, then, you know, we're old my Molson. So we didn't have uh, private planes, I should say. Now they all have, right. I mean, they're not even planes or luxury things. But um, <clears throat> he'd bring me back. He'd grab a couple cans of beer, come back. He'd, and he'd give me the little napkin and he'd tell me to write down our penalty killing. Well, what do you think about our penalty killing? He'd put a pen and napkin. I thought we were coming back here to have a beer, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I'd sit there and I'd think, and then I'd, I'd kind of write something down. And and Bob is that guy that he'd look at it, and then he'd look at you, and he'd look at it again, and then he'd look at you. And now you're you're just getting fidgety, and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, I, I, I did something, I did something wrong. <laughs> and then he goes, no, and it was like, and that's all he'd say. And then he'd kind of show you. <clears throat> so he was teaching all the time. Yeah. That that's what his thing was, but he he. He's a 24-7 hockey guy, just constantly thinking the game. It's it's the reason Doug Armstrong, who I believe now, who Army learned his craft from, I believe, yes. is if not the best, one of the best GMs in the league. Yeah. And I think Army kind of does his, he goes about his job, some of those things that Bob has done. Yeah. Um, just very thinks things through. What's and, funny is like, so you and I know Army. Army was a very emotional person mm-hmm. as a younger person. Oh, he'd sit up there, Mike, at times when I was sitting up there and he'd be banging as an assistant, he'd be banging on the desk up there from, you know, however high that is. 
and be complaining about Zuby doing something down there. And yep. I'm like, dude, it looks a lot easier up here than down there. And now he's kind of chill, right? I think. And I, I agree. <laughs> I think that's where the Bob has worn on, or worn on him. And he's been become a better uh, GM because of that. But what does he do? One thing that Ganey told me. So, so Bob calls me out the year after I retired. <clears throat> and it was, it was in like February. No, it wasn't. It was earlier than that. It was like December. I'm out snowmobiling. It's about two o'clock in the afternoon. I just retired. We just won the cup. So I'm out like eight of my friends riding. And we stopped at this place called the Hooten Barn. They have a one pound burger. You know, this UP kind of stuff, right? And phone rings and it's him. And, and my buddies are all yelling. I said, hey. So I decided to go outside. I didn't realize how long I was going to talk. <clears throat> you know, I didn't. I had my leather bottoms on, but I didn't take a jacket out there. And when it's Bob Ganey, you sit there and you listen and you nod your head, even though he's not there. He was actually, <clears throat> he says, I, I have a I have a plan A, but I need a plan B, B before I pull the trigger on plan A. And I'm like, I have no idea where this guy's going again. And he wanted to relieve the coach of his duties with our minor league team in Kalamazoo. And so he asked me and I said, man, let me think about it. You know, I just got done and I'm kind of wanting to chill and he wanted me to leave in a couple of weeks. And I said, OK, let me let me think about it. And he goes, OK. And then um, he said to me, and, you know, if you do decide to do it, we have about we have a couple games and then there's like five or six days completely off. And I said, OK. And he goes, you should bring your stuff with you. And I said, I am. I, I'll bring my, I don't bring skates, gloves. I don't we don't need a helmet there. And he goes, no, bring all your equipment. And I was like, why do you want me to bring my equipment? Because you could skate with the guys. I'm like, I don't want to skate with the guys. That's why I'm done. And he goes, well, okay, hang up the phone. I'm calling back a couple of days. Bob will do it. And he goes, okay, get in your truck tomorrow and leave and start driving to Michigan. I said, okay. And then he says, you bring your stuff with you? And I said, no, Bo. I said, why, why do you want me? He goes, well, here, I'd like you to come back. I said, come back where? To the team, to Dallas. And I'm like, what? And I said, oh, man, I got to think about that. So it, I, he said, I said, give me some time. And because it was, you know, I had talked to everybody else. And I just, I ultimately told him, "Is Bob, listen, I, I can't do it. Um, I said, I'm just about 40. It's mid-season. And the biggest problem I have was I have, my kids are just starting high school. And I said, I don't care if I get burnt by these young guys right now, but my kids got to go to school. And say, holy shit, did your dad get burnt last night? And I said, I can't put my kids through that. But but Bob was that guy that walked through and knew the answers before he asked the questions and he wanted to get the right ones and things like that. That's why I respect that guy. And, and so that's why I, I always wonder when it comes to the coaches and all this kind of stuff that goes on, the hiring, the firing, the changing, the stability of an organization, which kind of leads me to the hire, Pete DeBoer. Yep. So... When you said now, because there was a time here where, you know, other coaches were being hired. Cassidy, Trotz didn't really go out there. He was the guy, right? And now he's doing the right thing. Take your seven million, take a year off, and then come back next year. Um, you know, so there were some. So Rick Tockett is still out there, and there's some of these names. So was was Pete DeBoer? I mean, did they bring that you know? Did they bring any of these guys in for interviews? Were they waiting for a period? Or was Pete the guy they went after? Or? I think this. I don't know if they brought other guys in. I think a lot of this stuff was done by the phone. Even Pete said a lot of his stuff, I think, was done by the phone. Uh, but I think he was the number one candidate from the start. Really? And part of that is the numbers that he has produced in his career. Part of that is the philosophy of we're just here to win in the playoffs. And I do think they embrace that philosophy. Yeah. You know, get in at seven, you know, get to the Stanley Cup final. Well, he's done that mm -hmm. several times. And, and part of it is... I think he, they think he's incredibly hungry. I think, and you know, just talking to him for a few brief moments. Well, he's got to be incredibly pissed off after the Vegas. He is, he is. Like, if there's somebody you want to ram it up their ass, it's going to be these guys, and they just happen to be in the West, and maybe that's a team that you got to get in because they are a good team. Yes. They're a good team. And if they get healthy and everything else, maybe that's a team that we're going to have to play in the playoffs to knock them out of the playoffs. Correct. Maybe there's some motivation there. Yeah, definitely. And, and then not just against Vegas. I think to show, for him to show everybody – Look, do you know what I just did? Because I think the previous two seasons, he may have had the best regular season yeah. record in hockey. Yeah. And then you're just like, and now I get well, canned? Didn't that happen to Gallant too the yeah. first time around? I mean, he you know, only took him to the finals yeah. and they fired him. Yeah. So anyway, so, that's a Vegas thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and so 
I do think all that mixed into he's the right guy at the right time and that they can support him. And part of that is I think they had to make the decision, I don't know, four or five months ago that Jim No was the GM. And I think once they did that, then I think this is a, you know, a, I don't know if it's all Jim or if ownership and Brad Alberts and Jim Lights and whoever See, else. That when you go there, you know what I want for this organization? Surround yourself with some hockey people. I agree. You know, get get some guys that not they have good people there, but if you had like that, go back to Doug Armstrong. Think of the people that came through there. Yep. Bob Ganey. I think Dave Taylor's still there. He's got Al McKinnis there. He brought in Brodeur there. And that's what I was going to go with. Bob said, Bob said, if you ever want to get in this business, surround yourself with good people. Yeah. Better Dave people. Taylor was in Dallas yeah. for a little while. Yeah. Les uh, Jackson would be another guy, you know, again, all Craig that kind Gunn. of stuff. You know, these are, these are hockey guys. Yeah. And, and they, yeah. and Bob was really good at that. Like I'll go back to the assistant coaches. Those two guys were as much a part of the personality of this team, Rick Wilson and, and Doug um, Oh, Jarvis. for sure. And, and, and you, and, I didn't even, speaking of Jarvis, Doug yeah. Jarvis, Wills I knew because I was with Wills since college. But Doug Jarvis, you know, I played against him. He was, talk about Cagliano. I mean, everybody was going at Jarvis. He originally had that record right. as far as long, or most games played in a row. And, but you don't know, we had no clue. We just thought Jarvis was some clown on the bench. He fell off the bench a couple times. Right. He gets all, Very you know, excited. Quiet. Right. But when you when I was done and working with them, like I'd walk into an office one day when we were going into the office in the morning, and the coaches are all supposed to meet, and I walked in and I could hear this talking going on. And Hitchcock always got there really super early. And Hitch is talking to someone, and I kind of pushed the door open a little bit before I walked in, and it was Jarvi. Jarvi was telling him what the forecheck would should be like, what we should do this like. And Hitch was like, okay. And then I got a bigger because you don't appreciate these assistant coaches. Yeah. Just like, and we have Julie Dobbs in here, right? Just like her husband. The things that Kelly does and the rec track record that he has as far as being the video guy offside and all that kind of stuff, it's always the guys behind the head coaches that do all that work. Yeah. So speaking of assistant coaches, do you have any idea what he direction he would go? I do not. Um, he has got... Do you want to mention my name to him? I, okay. You know me. I've said this a hundred <laughs> times. I think you would be great. No, but the have you heard fact, anything? No, I have not. Uh, he has a history of hiring a, a couple of different guys. So I think we have to watch that and see if those guys are up. Mm -hmm. uh, John Stevens just got named in Vegas this morning uh, for Cassidy. Oh, he did. Yeah, okay. he, so he'll run the defense okay. there. So these things are weird, and you've got to find the right personality. You've got to have the right interview. You've got to be available. You've got yep. to want to come to Dallas, Texas. Um, so it, it'll, be, it'll be, one, strange, and two, incredibly important to get those right people in the right places. Sure. And so, yeah, I'm very curious to see what, what Pete does. Uh, he's done it before. Uh, he's done it several times. This is his fifth coaching job. Well, and that's kind of where I was wondering what kind of coach they wanted to hire because, to me, you can come in and you can say, this is the kind of system I, I'm going to play. I don't know if I agree with that because I think you play the system. Your, your players dictate the system that you're going to play. Like, now you're going to try to go into, for example, Florida Panthers, and you're going to try to change them or, or tweak them. Paul Maurice, who I think is, I love that guy, former coach in Winnipeg Jets. But um, I would think he would be great no matter what kind of team. But when you bring in whoever the coach is that comes in here, Bones did a great job. He stayed with what he felt was their strength, which was keeping the puck out of the net, right. playing well, keeping shot, you know, analytically and all that kind of stuff down, those kind of things. So, and one of the words that, I, I was like, what did he just say there when he was doing the interview? He said, unlock the offense. Okay. Well, who are you going to unlock? Is it Gary Onov? We already know about Robertson. We know about Hintz. Okay. And, and Joe Pavelski is going to fit in the middle there, I would assume again. And Joe's, maybe he's not, but at some point he's going to start slowing down. Yeah, and I, I would say I'm I, with you. I mean, at some point he's yeah. going to. But he, he takes care of him. He's one of them odd ducks, man. He takes care of him. He's a Wisconsin guy, so that's yeah. why. It's part of it. And But he just knows how to play with young kids, which I think it was – have been it's a no-brainer for me to bring him back. Oh, yeah. Because those two guys could use another year at least under Joe and how he goes about his business every day. But when you're going to unlock the offense, does that mean you're going to bring in some offense or are you unlocking – who are you unlocking? I think against? it's two things. One, the kids. Again, Which was I was going to ask you about what kids you think can make it here, but tell me who you're unlocking from last year. From last year, it's Ben Sagan and potentially Miro. 
as odd as that sounds, you look at at uh, Makar and say, oh, my God, he is. Yeah, but they're not the same player. He can't do what Makar did. Puck-wise. Uh, he I get can't. That. He Makar can be east west and and he does crazy things. Miro has his own special set of I skills. I agree, but the belief is, at least I think, from what I've heard from different people, is he has not pushed himself to be that guy. He did in the playoffs because he would. He did. I had talked to you. I, I, bubble, I had thought coming thing. off of last year that I thought last year again it, it's been a clusterfuck with everything that's gone on here, but that he needed to be better than he was last year. Correct. And this year, I didn't think he was in the beginning. He was kind of the same guy. And the only reason I say that is because there's so much there. Yeah. And then all of a sudden in the playoffs, it was like, boom. That's the guy that should be playing like that in the regular season if you can you know, continue right. that through. Like McCarr does it through the regular season. Well, but- and then there's two things, two parts of that. One, I think John leaving will allow Miro to potentially... Like, Is he gone? I think. I okay. just don't know. Let's how get to him next. Okay. But if John is gone, mm-hmm. and one, and then two, if you bring in a partner, a right-handed partner that allows Miro to play the left side, I think you're going to get okay. a lot That's more. That's on my list to ask you right. who that is. Is that Petrie? I don't. I, I, do you want me to give you the weird one? Because. Is there anybody in-house, in the system? Not right-handed. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to go with uh, Hockenpah, and just who who was, I thought he was good for I thought what he, was he is. Just for what he is, let's be care- Let's not take not throwing anybody under the bus nope. here. Let's not. Jordy Ben, yep, was an excellent five six defenseman. Yep, and then the more situations that, and then it kind of tilted a little bit. You have to be who you are. Should Hawk and Pa be that guy that's going to play twenty seven nights minutes a night? I I think he wouldn't be on the power play. I think he would be Craig Ludwig to Sergei Zuboff, where. You bounce it off to him. You allow him to do what he. You have it. You just back. give him the puck. Well, you you could handle it too. I don't think like well, you hand, handle which part. I don't think Zuby's passes were bouncing off your stick. No, he wouldn't pass to me. <laughs> he made the right decision. <laughs> he, he yeah. read, no, he, he would not the, get. I gave it to him, well. and then it was done. Now so, my job is if you make if you ever make a a poor pass, which very rarely did, I needed to know how to play a two-on-one. Yeah. And that was a conversation we had with Hitchcock. And yeah. he would give Zuby shit. And I said, Hitch, I'm playing with him for a reason. You let him do what he wants. And when you frustrate him, give him shit. And, oh, you want me to just dump it in like that? Go ahead. Well, right. that's not what our superstar forwards want. No. So you have to know your role. Correct. And I would say Hawk and Pock could be could that, that. that guy that and he understands finish, that role. And he's right-handed and yeah. yada, yada, yada. That, to me, is the, the in-house answer. So you're saying Hawk and Pock is a top two defenseman? No. I'm saying you have to structure your team to use players the best at even strength mm-hmm. and the power play and the penalty kill. Miro plays 26 because yeah. he's going to play in and every situation. And he could situation. play 36. Right. And because he's going to play in every situation. Yeah. Hawk and Pock wouldn't. Could right. he play 22? Or, you know, and then not... So he's more of a five-on-five slash PK guy, which I get that, but you want Miro against top lines from the other team all night long. Can Hawk and Pa carry that load against the, I think McKinnon, of, of all the Landis players guy. you have, yes. Okay. Him or... or uh, I thought he was great. Or S For whatever role but he was S, in, he was good. S, I think, would drag Miro down. S is just slow. Mm-hmm. He's methodical. At least Hawking I think, could get up in the play or at least keep up with Miro. In-house. Yeah. All right? I'm going to throw one at you that I think is ridiculous, but I keep going back to it. Brent Burns. He's well, 37 years that old. That kind of Yeah, but he's the 37-year-old that can still play like a 34-year-old. His and I saw his name season. out there somewhere, which we're going to go into. Well, well, let's talk about this. What have they got left? $19 million uh, cap space? Well, again, it depends. They on haven't done Robertson. They haven't correct. done Hints. What's Burns making? He's making 11, 12, eight. Eight now? Eight cap. Is his, does his contract go like this then? No. He has three okay. years left at eight, eight, eight cap hit. Mm-hmm. Now, I think his contract actually comes down money wise if you're worried about the money. Well, uh, that's a, always a big concern. Around well, that. I think the cap is bigger than. Oh, you're money. talking about as he gets older. Yeah, he's but got- he, to me, and I know people dump on Suter a little, uh, they have. But Suits is the kind of guy that in, in a skating game, the game has changed a little bit. He can still play. Well, and at the cost. And I'm not saying he's going to play 30 minutes. No. You know, but. Him but I'm and just Minnie saying, at nine. But Burns is, is a, he is, 
he's a reckless player. Like he, he goes this way. I agree. And so, so then, and is Miro that is who you want with Miro? But because what Miro I'm saying is, that back. if you put him with Miro, somebody's got to play defense. But you want Miro to go. I that, don't know if he can play them two together the to and have them both be that play that style because Burns will probably if Miro's got the puck and skating, Burns is probably right next to him. So to again, then, are we run, counting on Ottinger you, to be Vasilevsky well, this year? Then could you run a hybrid in which uh, Burns plays with Miro at times and then Hockenpah plays? To with me, Miro it's always time. about chemistry. Correct. Those guys get to need to get to know each other. So uh, then again, that's. A, Pete DeBoer, you're going to unlock it. Good luck unlocking that. Yeah. You know how you're going to do that. I, I just was curious. I mean, I, I've seen well, the, the name out is, there. It's Sagan and Ben. Can you get more from those two? My belief is you have I think, to. I, you have don't to they both have certain things? Like with Jamie, I, I compare Jamie to Brendan Morrow in a way. Brendan Morrow, who I absolutely love that kid, probably took two, three, four years off his career because of how hard he played. Right. And and Jamie's bigger, stronger. I understand that. But Jamie's that's he has to play that straight north game to be effective, to lead his team. I, that's what I think. Yeah. I think when he starts trying to play like Tyler Sagan, not that Tyler's played like Tiger or like he has, Tyler has four years ago. I, I, I believe this is a year you got to give him a pass because of the surgery yeah. and all this other kind of stuff. But is that step coming back? And did you see him get a little bit quicker as the season got down to the end? Because I thought I did see that from Tyler a little bit. It seemed like he was getting places better. I didn't notice that. I will look closer when he comes mm-hmm. back. Um, my biggest problem is I think he changed his mindset. Um, and so his mindset was get to the net, get dirty. Oh, I've had that problem. You know, that, that, I don't know if that's a mindset or that's just maturity because maybe when you're having it, because we're Tyler, I think for a while, he was scoring on that offside, that shot. And when that doesn't go in and when it doesn't go in here, you have to find a way to get back on track. Just get closer to the net. How many goals near the end did Tyler score off his skate, off his ass? Almost like 90% of his goals the whole season. It's kind of like even when a goal scorer is in a slump and he gets an empty netter and he's gone seven, eight goals without one, it's just an empty netter. They kind of puff their chest yep. out. They're back again. Tyler found a way to, to gravitate more to the net, and he got rewarded for Correct. it. And that's, I think, so why. My question is, what will he be going forward? Is this a good thing? Will he become a better, Well, you're telling me player, that you're telling me that not? Ben and Sagan are going to be part of unlocking the offense. Well, here's the thing. I think they almost have to do it separately. So in my vision of Ben unlocking the offense, he becomes Patrick Maroon. He becomes a checking line player who is gritty, who can play with good checking line players like Delandria or um, oh, who's the kid they brought so in you, you, uh, to, to say that, do you Mexico. think Jamie would take 15, 14 minutes a night? Well, he played, I think, 14 this year. So is that a way of presenting that to a player like that that's a captain and should be the, the heartbeat of the team and, and give them that conversation in July – of Jamie, and then he's which, on the number one power play. Well, but to say, Jamie, this is a what we'd like you to do. If you're not happy with it, I would understand it. Yeah. Would you waive your no trade? Um, I don't know if I'd go that far. I, I guess if he really wasn't happy with it, then you have to have the discussion. Mm-hmm. My theory is, and we'll go to the kids now, is that Wyatt Johnston's your number two center. Uh, I think he can do it. I mean, you look at the numbers. He could step in as a that as young a kid, nineteen year old kid. Yeah. You look at what he did. You talk to people. Who, numbers wise, major junior. Number college, wise, yeah. like yeah. and again, it took Robertson a year in the minors. But you can't do that with this kid because he's either got to go back to juniors or he has to make the NHL. Mm-hmm. But I think you you got to roll the dice at least for nine games. And so he's got to make that. He's got to he's got to show that he can do that in that first eight nine games well, before and they then, have to send but him back. But he also has World Juniors before that, which mm-hmm. is rare this year. So my guess is he's going to be one of the key players for Team Canada at World Juniors. If he shows you there, then now you have six, seven exhibition games or Traverse City or whatever. And then you potentially have eight or nine regular season games. By that time, you should have a pretty good idea. So if he's in the two hole, you got Jamie in the three or the four hole? Three. Okay, so so does that mean Raddick Fox is gone? I would say yes. So... 
Okay, as yes, we're trying to get Brent Burns here, if I'm if I'm the assistant GM, would San Jose be interested in a three point whatever two five cap hit for Radic Fox, and would that help defray the cost of a Brent Burns or whoever you're trying to make a trade for? Um, because today is a day of four line teams. Though, who's your four center? Okay, how about that, Delandria? Is that who? Delandria. Did you see him in that last game? I uh, is he a centerman? It, he, does he know he, the responsibility of his yes, own end yet? Yes. Because if he does, I love that, the energy that, that he brings. That's what he is, technically. Yep. And again, it's funny to, to look at three of the key players for the Stars. Yes. Haskinen, yeah. uh, Delandria, Wyatt, Wyatt Johnson, Johnson are all known as defensive-minded players before they're off. So we're unlocking the offense from Pete DeBoer. Are we, is this called a retool then, I think, yeah. or a rebuild? I think a tweak, in my opinion, because you have to. Is this get... where you're going to send a letter out to the fans and say this, <laughs> like the Rangers did? Well, that? the hope is you do this and you win. Okay, the hope is that Ottinger's Ottinger to start Ottinger's with. Ottinger's Ottinger, Miro's Miro, even better. Uh, Essa's Essa. Uh, uh, who else you got on the back then? Back end there. Um... See, that's the problem. Is Sekiro there? Is no. Petrie going to be there? It might be Petrie. Uh, but he's like in what five or six? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't think you can do them both. You you have to do and one. And he's thirty four. Correct. I'm not saying he's not. No, no. But I, the, and and the, the the best example is. But Jer- where, is where's Pavelski. the Harley and the Hanley and these guys? You need you need Harley. Hanley's your. And if they're there, games. this is a retool. Is it? I don't know. Are you going to tell me that they can get to the third round? I'm telling you, they can make the playoffs. And then that's good. That's all you got to do. Uh, we've learned 82, that's all. Just get there. A team after 82 games with this coach and hopefully the coaching staff he brings in should be able to react well to whatever the challenge is. Now, that being said, the old coaching staff reacted pretty well and they still lost to a good Calgary team. So mm-hmm. is that a failure? Well, they fired everybody. I, don't, you <laughs> I, mean, know what? I don't know either. It, I was, don't it know. was a really good I don't season. Think Calgary, it was a really good playoff series. I, I think a lot of that you got to look at Calgary. I don't think Calgary played anywhere near what they did during the regular season. I was actually shocked when they were playing against Dallas. And Dallas actually, you know, they did a good job with what they had. They played the way that they had to play. Right. People can complain and about it all they want. Very scoring series on both ends. Yes. And and you got an extraordinary performance from your goaltender. Correct. Ottinger was incredible. Hopefully that's who he's going to be. Because we've seen it from other goaltenders in the league where they come in and they're this their first kick at it. And then, you know, Philly kid, Hart, you know, they kind of have those kind of issues before. In St. Louis, basically. Yeah. Bennington wins a couple cups or a cup. And then all of a sudden he's like that. And, you know, the, the kid in um, Pittsburgh. Yep. Same thing. He won a couple cups and then goes to Ottawa and, he, you know, nothing happens there when they trade him. So, but they trade him. So there's a reason that they traded him, right? They, you know, whoever that was, they saw that coming. So, uh, you know, I get it. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what kind of team this is also. I think it's going to be a process. It's work in progress again. Yeah, and I mean, part of the problem is they want to win now. That's Jim Nils. Get to the playoffs, Mm -hmm. try and win now. Anything can happen. Part of the reason is you've got two 37-year-old guys who they still think they can squeeze something out of, a captain who might be older than 32 or 33, and a, he's only 30, a potential number one center who yeah. is 30 years old and should be in the prime of his career. Can he get back to that? Right. So now you take that group, then you add Robertson, then you add Hintz, then you add Haskinen. Then you're like, we got six guys and Ottinger. We got seven, eight guys who are we think are pretty good players here, mm-hmm. right? Or who we need to win now. Yeah. So now can we then support that with the Glenn Dennings or the so Nemethnikovs? Let me ask the, you about Glenn Denning. But uh, Glenn Denning reminds me of Raffle. Are they not? Do they not want Raffle back, or no, they just Raffle, want him back? They want him at a at a price. And I don't they think. want at their price because that I thought he was valuable. I thought Glenning, right. Glenn Denning did what he should do too. Correct. I think those two guys for me kind of stood out a lot yep. just because of where they were, their ages, what they do. Three guys, in fact, Hockenpah, yeah, Glenn Denning, Raffle. So like, and unfortunately, you don't make it back to the playoffs when those are the three. I'll give you a scenario. We're in the playoffs one year. Bundy, Sean Chambers and I are partners. Hitch comes into the room. It's always Hitch shit that I got to bring up all the time. <laughs> Hitch comes into the room and he looks at the guys and he goes, how in the fuck do you expect us to win this game when Bundy and Ludwig are our best two defensemen out there? And I was like, is that a Wait compliment? A <laughs> like, well, what the hell was that? You know, it was 100% accurate. Right. But so it's kind of the same thing that you're saying right now is now you're counting on three uh 
Role middle players. of the road right. uh, players that are going to lead us? And you're going to say, I don't think they will. I think what they did was they showed to me that they can take another step. No, that you can fill those positions at a price. So that's where the cap is going to work for you. And yeah. so if you have to pay Jason Robertson or. Well, that's where Pence, we're going here. Correct. Or Ottinger or whoever, you can find these guys. And like the best example to me is. Uh, Jamie Alexiak leaves for four point eight million. Hockenpah comes in. Yeah, and is it that much different? Didn't so, Jamie Alexiak leave and then come back? Well, he went. Haven't, to haven't we had like four players that do that? Yeah, we get rid of them and then they get Benny, better. Benny they, they figure out how to play somewhere else, and then we bring them back. We, we get good coaching elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but what Jamie did is so when he decided to go to uh, Seattle. They were going to pay him big money. They had big money. They wanted to fill the spot. Yeah. But again, it was responsible of them to let that position go to not pay him four point whatever, mm -hmm. and then to get Hawk and Pie at a much more reasonable price to do pretty much the same job. My theory on uh, Radic Fox is well, you got Raffle and Clendenning for almost nothing. Why do you need to pay your checking line center three point whatever? Right. You got Delandria who looks like. He could fill that. Yeah. And if you want Jamie to play left wing and have Delandria play center in the checking line. See, and I think Jamie is a better centerman. I do too. Because right. I think Jamie is a beast in the faceoff circle, number one, and he plays better with flow. Yep. You know, there's more responsibility with that position. Yep. The wing, I, I think Jamie plays better when he can continue to move versus a winger that has to come down, stop, get the puck, and take off again. You can't. You can't I, I think he needs to keep it moving. I don't want to say hide. You can't be non-confrontational when you're in the center spot. Like the wing, you can just eh, go yeah. up and down. When you're in the center spot, you're already starting with a fight for the face off. Mm -hmm. And then that to me is what, that's that's his oxygen. Yeah, that's so, why I keep talking about, it, it's, it, and again, the Bergeron's. If you yeah. gotta, you build up the middle of the ice. I mean, that's it. You go from a goalie to a defenseman to a centerman. You gotta have them three spots and you kind of build around those guys. Let's talk about money, cap. What about what are we doing here with um, Robertson? It's a hard one because I think on paper he's a seven, eight, nine million dollar player, depending mm -hmm. on short term long. or long term. Well, I would try to go short term, uh, although it will bite you eventually because yeah, you if, do, if he stays on that run, yeah. well, and you got to get hints next year. Yeah. So now hints is not going to be short term because he's coming off his bridge contract. Robertson's going into, quote unquote, a bridge contract. So then you can say, could you do two years at six million or whatever? But I mean, he's mm -hmm. he's going from 900,000 to at least six million. You hope he gets horny and takes it. Yeah. And then, and then and, but be sold to him. Your next one could be worth well, nine then, or ten. And then his agent needs to do right. and show him John Klingberg and say, you signed this too long and you're painting yourself in a corner because who knows where this cap's going mm -hmm. in two years. Well, yeah. you want to, you as a player, you kind of want to ride that out and get to that point. Correct. Because now if the door opens up, now you're, now right. you're a UFA. Okay, so, so what, what? John what? didn't become a UFA till thirty. He yeah. should have been at twenty-seven. And he, and he wants to get paid now on what he did three years ago. And four he's years also ago. sad that he didn't get paid the last two or three That's years. That's what I mean. And you're just like, well, I can't pay for that. I can't. I'm not going to. I can't blow restructure it up. The, yeah. You know. So and now, so, what about Ottinger? Ottinger, a good goal is five million, right? So has he done it? Well, a really good goal is about 10. And, you know, well, but, but that yeah. was a mistake, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but like a good, solid, young goal is 5 million mm -hmm. bucks. So does he do that for a year or two? And then again, same thing. Well, That's be, what I'd be trying to do. I would be yeah. trying to do too. Yeah, because you want to, especially with the goalies. You yep. see how young kid was he, 23? Yes. And that was his best one there, yeah. right? So. And, and then the other thing is, is that when this is all over, Pavelski comes off the books and Jamie's getting there. I think he's only got three years left. And mm -hmm. then, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Suter's there, but it's only at four point, three point, something like that. Yeah. So it's, it's more reasonable than the eight million. But the problem well, is, is Tyler's, you know, nine million for yeah. years to come. And Jamie's. Both of them. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he's, Jamie, I think only has three years left. But again, the other good thing about Jamie is his money, actual money starting to go down to like six million. So, well, I'll tell you what, Mike. Speaking of over, 
<laughs> I got things to do, and it's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. And I, I really appreciate you coming in here because you got more insight on what's going on inside. And um, is the Rinky Dink podcast still up and running? Not running, but we'll get it back. Yeah. Uh, Daryl's really good about it. It's it's his baby, and yeah. he has so many good ideas, and you have so oh, many good ideas. Oh, I know. Ideas. Jesus, he he's the guy that run, I think he actually runs the organization, to be honest with you. So, uh, But again, thanks, Mike Heike, for coming in. And uh, we will get Razor in here. And I, I, I love the knowledge and everything that you get to know. And um, we are out of here. So thank you very much for sitting here in <laughs> on the Suds with Bloods. Typically, nobody gave me a beer. Otherwise, we'd be toasting right now to let you know that it's Suds with Bloods. But we'll do that next time. I don't drink water. Thanks. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>